Christoph, I, like you, have been interested in consciousness my whole life. I did a doctorate in cerebral cortex electrophysiology before I went bad and became an investment banker. Uh, and my interest, though, in consciousness has been continuous throughout my life. And I've read many of the philosophers, the theologians, as well as the scientists. And uh, many non-scientists think that consciousness cannot be explained by brain function. You talk about the neural correlates of consciousness. What exactly does that mean? Well, I mean, just to, to, to step back to frame it a little bit. So as you pointed out, people, let's see, in the West since 2300 years, at least Plato and Aristotle have wondered about consciousness. And so many people think it's something that can't be addressed by science. I think nothing is further from the truth. And to, to, advance, this, uh, to advance the scientific agenda, the scientific program of trying to understand consciousness and its place in the natural world, so the Francis Crick and I, we've been working on this since 20 years, we said, we decided, okay, let's not worry about these endless philosophical debates, you know, that often have no conclusion whatsoever. <laughs> and let's avoid that by focusing on something that we can, that almost everybody, no matter where they fall on the ideological divide, can agree on. And that is the correlates of consciousness in the brain. What we mean by that, there will be parts of your brain that are specifically that correlate with any one specific conscious thought or memory or intention or belief. So when I'm angry, when I, when I feel angry, that's a conscious state, and there's going to be some neural mechanism that's responsible for generating that state. When I see your, your black clothes, when I see black, that's a conscious state, and there are going to be some neurons that are, that, are responsible for, uh, that, that are responsible for that, that correlate with that, and that ultimately are responsible that cause that conscious state. You know, when, when I feel me, when I feel sad, when I, I have a toothache, all of those different conscious states, there will be correlates. And Francis and I are asking, what's the... For any one such conscious percept, what's the minimal neuronal mechanism? Mm. So, for instance, you may know there's a small part of the brain called the cerebellum or the little brain. It actually contains more neurons than all the big brain mm. together. Now, the cerebellum is probably responsible for fine, you know, fine, if I want to play piano or do really fine rock climbing like I love to do, you, you need the cerebellum. But there's no evidence that for me to consciously see or feel anything, I need the cerebellum. So we can see, well, the cerebellum is probably not necessary. Now, what about my eyes? Right, so I, I, I see through my eyes. So you would think, well, clearly you need your eyes to see. Well, no, because each one of us, you also, at night we dream. And we dream visually. And we dream with our eyes totally closed. And we have very vivid conscious state. It's a very vivid conscious state. It's not the same as right now because I don't have introspection. I don't, I'm not surprised when I see somebody who died 20 years ago, you know, talking to me. I can fly. So, so there's certain weird things about it. But when I dream, it feels as real as life, right? So here you have a state where you can see things, but you don't need your eyes. Certainly, I can close my eyes. I can still imagine you. I see you so sort of faintly, not, not, not very vividly, but I can certainly see your face and your glasses and your, 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 and your black clothes. And so, again, we conclude that your eyes are probably involved in most forms of normal seeing, but that's not where consciousness happens. So we can t take the same logic, apply it to different parts of the brain, and we can ultimately apply it not just to one part of the brain, but to the specific nerve cells in the brain. We can ask which circuit in which particular part of the brain is necessary for this specific conscious uh, sensation, with which molecules, which synapses, which axon, which wires. Just like you can ask the question, What's the correlate for, her for heredity? Now, we know it's, there are many correlates. One of them is DNA, right? And we know that DNA seems to be the mechanism that stores my genetic information over many, many years. And so, likewise, we, we're trying to apply a, a very similar logic to consciousness in the brain. And the hope, the hope is that we can concentrate on this question. We can avoid the philosophical debates because, as I said, most everybody agrees there will be such correlates in the brain. We can study them. We can study them in me. In you, we can ask other commonalities. When I see red and when you see red, well, we probably don't see red like this, the red of this table exactly the same, but we see it probably very similar. So we're probably going to have, and we know this, similar parts of the brain that are involved in conscious perception of red. So what exactly are the similarities between your and my brain? I can train a monkey. So monkeys also like us, they have three types of cone receptors in their eye, and they see colors very similar the way we do. Well, so I can train a monkey to, tell, to, to, to do a task where he has to do some sort of color perception. I can ask where are the neurons in, in his brain. And of course, in the monkey brain, I can put electrodes in the brain and query the individual neurons. I can mm. sort of listen to the individual neurons, the way they talk. 
And so I can ask, what are the commonalities? What about other commonalities in my brain, your brain, the monkey brain, between sort of seeing blue, seeing red, seeing black, uh, seeing something move, seeing a face? And so um, what about then in the brain of an infant? You know, do I really know that an infant, infant can clearly move and act and scream, but is an infant conscious? Does an infant have already color perception? What about a patient, a brain of a patient who had a stroke, who can't talk to, uh, to me anymore? So those are all different subjects I can investigate and always with the eye, where's the neural correlate of consciousness? What happens in sleep? What happens in dreaming? What happens under anesthesia when the person is put, um, is put asleep? What happens in coma? You are careful to distinguish between correlation and cause. Yeah, for, for several reasons. One is correlation. Everybody can agree there are correlates of consciousness in the brain, independent of what you believe about the mind-body divide. But when you talk about causes, then you're taking a position and you're really saying, well, this is what causes this rather than this is what correlates with. And then you get, what exactly do you mean by causation, which turns out to be a very thorny problem in, in philosophy and, and in science. You know, what exactly do you mean by cause? So A, at, the, at, the ontological, um, at the ontological level, we prefer to stick with, uh, with a more neutral correlation. Also in the brain, it's going to be difficult. The brain is like a society, heavily, heavily, inter, heavily inter, um, uh, networked, heavily interconnected. So one neuron, let's say a typical neuron in your brain, in your cortex, may talk to 10,000 other neurons. They may receive input from 10,000 other neurons. At the same time. At the same time, yes. And so it's very difficult sometimes or often to assign direct causation to say, well, this neuron triggered that neuron. Sometimes you can say that, but very often you can just say, well, this neuron sort of goes up and on average, this neuron also becomes more excited, but it also gets input from 500 other neurons. So who exactly was responsible for, for making this neuron really excited? Some, it's very often difficult to say. And so right now, we don't partly, we don't have the tools to really allow us to, to really rigorously make these statements about, about causation, but we do have tools where we can correlate. For instance, in a magnetic scanner, I can put you in a magnetic scanner, I can image you essentially when you're looking at red, and I can say, well, whenever you see consciously, see red, this part of the brain lights up. That we can do today. To, to make the jump to saying, well, this part of the brain is actually causally required to see red, that's much more di difficult. Then for one, for example, I need to know what happens if you lose that part of the brain, like in a stroke, sometimes that happens. But also I need to say, well, if I stimulate this part of the brain with, let's say, an exterior electrode that I put into your brain, then you actually see red. But that's very difficult to do in normal people, right? So, so, so correlation is relatively easy, just observing something, but actually interfering with perturbing a system is experimentally much more difficult to do. I like the philosophical overview where everybody not only can agree, they must agree that when you show neurons being excited or inhibited in certain stimuli all the time, that, that that is correlated. Then if they want to make their own causation or whichever way they can, they're free to do that or not do that. But you're forcing them to admit that the correlation is absolute. Except with philosophers, you always find people who disagree. So there are some people who say the entire project of finding causes or correlates of consciousness in the brain sort of is doomed. You're not going to find anything interested. And consciousness really sort of flow. It's not only in the brain, it's not only in the body, but it's, it's the entire interaction of the living brain with a living organ in its surround, and you can't loca localize consciousness to any one component. Sure. I mean, there's going to be every order of magnitude people are going to say the consciousness occurs. That we understand. But still, they have to admit that, you're, that what you're seeing is, is correlated to whatever the, uh, the specific uh, the conscious event is. Yes. Yeah, so I guess what, what they would say, yes, it's correlated, but so do many other things correlate with consciousness, and this isn't going to help you <laughs> that much. Well, we think the project is to m find ever more precise correlates, to ever make that, mm. that relationship between conscious perception in your head and, and some brain states ever more and more precise. And ultimately, of course, just like in the Matrix, remember in the Matrix? Mm. So in the Matrix, what happened, these aliens, and the, these, they create percepts in your head, in Neil's head, for instance, by stimulating his brain appropriately, right? So ultimately, we, we can begin to do this in a very crude way. We can put electrode in a patient, and then you can stimulate, and sometimes the patient will see flashes of light or will have a little vignette, he remembers, oh yeah, he was with grandma in church, mm -hmm. and the surgeon stimulates the same part of the brain again, and yet again the patient will remember that mm -hmm. same memory. So in very crude ways we, um, we can do that, and as I said before, this allows us to ever more precisely pinpoint consciousness to specific neuronal populations in the brain. You have a very nice metaphor with the Rosetta Stone to what you're doing. How does that work about perceptual stimuli? 
Yeah, so the Rosetta Stone um, translated among three different languages. And so the three different languages that we're trying to... Well, the original one was uh, it, it, demonic, Egy 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 Egyptian Egyptian hieroglyphics. Demonic and Aramaic. Right, and it was the first time that Egyptian hieroglyphics was able exactly. to, be, decoded. to be decoded because decoded. it was done in terms of known languages at the time. Exactly. And so the, here the idea is that we have three things. We start off with the most fundamental thing in you and my life. That's my conscious perception. The only way, this is what people f <laughs> f and, and forget, the only way I know about the world, this goes back to René Descartes, Cogito Argosome, is because I experience it. I think about it. I feel about it. I may be totally mistaken how I feel about it. You may not be out there. You may be thinking <laughs> of my imagination. But as Oscar Wilde famously said, you can't I use perception. If I perceive it, that's the way it is for me. And so that's, a, the, 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 I mean, that's one side of this tria. The second one is then behavior. So I may see you and then I reach out my hand and shake your hand. Okay, so I can study the behavior of people. And thirdly, ultimately, I want to translate that into language of nuance. If I see something, if I see you, what goes on in my brain? What are the part of the brain that are, that are necessary? And if I reach out my hand to, to shake your hand, what are the nuances that are responsible for that? So I like to translate among those three languages, the language of the subjective, the language of the, of the objective behavior, and the language of the objective nuance.